Well, uh, thanks for coming along today. It's a great turnout. It's uh, good to, to, to have uh, some young faces here as well. There's not enough young faces by the looks of it, though. I'd like to see more. Um, so what I'm going to be trying to do today is uh, look at one of the most complex basins in the world in 45 minutes. And uh, I think over the, I've been working in the industry for 30 years now, and I, I pretty firmly believe this is uh, the most complex basin that I've ever looked at. And uh, one of the reasons for that is the title, that we have uh, two big shunts and a bank that happen in this basin that produce some pretty spectacular geology. Um, so we're going to see the effects of those two shunts and a bank, uh, which are really important to the petroleum system as well as the fundamental geology. So the uh, next slide shows you the <coughs> Basins, as far as we know, salt basins, the, the extent of them in the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. You can see that the US got the lion's share in terms of area. In fact, the onshore extension of the salt basin in the US is far greater than, uh, than what we have in the Campeche. There's also a little basin out there that some of you might know in Cuba that's apparently the same age. And uh, there's a certain person in, in the room called uh, Andy Pullum who's uh, allowed me to uh, quote his uh, newest work that uh, he's not yet published but sounds pretty interesting, the work he's been doing on the analysis of bromine in the, uh, in the salt. Is that right, Andy? And uh, this age is coming out. Taking the bromine is strontium. Strontium, sorry. <laughs> So the strontium isotope work is suggesting that the salt is actually Bajocian age, uh, some three or four million years older than it was in the Colovian that everybody's put it before, with not very much good evidence. So that, that's one of the first important and interesting things I want to say, that the salt may be in fact a bit older than we uh, have generally accepted with very poor information. So th th this is the time scale as we know it of what has happened in the Campeche Basin. I just want to talk you through the ages of some of these really important events that we're going to see in the geological record. So the first one is the rifting stage. It's an unusually long period of rifting that has occurred in not only in the uh, Gulf of Mexico and in the Mexico sector, but all the way up the Atlantic margin through the US. We have Carnian Age rifting that starts around 240, that's extremely well dated in the western US basins where we have principally red beds on shore. And then we have a period of rifting, that, that there may be some breaks in here, the period of rifting continues all the way through for almost 100 million years to 145 million years in the Tithonium, when we see the Tithonian source rocks, which are in here, Tithonian source rock deposited, those are draped over the fault blocks. So they blanket the end of the rift phase, and you actually see the rifts still preserved in these saga of Tithonian sediments that are dropping into the start half problems of the Jurassic Age. So <clears throat> then we have a long period of, uh, of deposition with, uh, with, with this carbonates first of all and then we go through into a clastic phase. That clastic phase is rather starved. If you look around most of the offshore Mexican area, the thickness of the Cretaceous sequence is only something like a few hundred meters to a kilometer. So we don't have much going on in the Cretaceous. And then all hell breaks loose in the tertiary when we have first of all the, uh, we have the laramide compression that starts in late Cretaceous times, uh, which is the same as the Rocky Mountains that we have all the way up to Canada. That really important mountain building event has created mountains that are three to four kilometers high all the way through Mexico and up into the, into the Canadian Cordillera. And that has had a very important effect on sediment transport with lots more sediment coming into the basin from late Cretaceous times onwards. So that quiet period is suddenly hit by this really important orogenic event, the Laramide. The Laramide is in fact mainly onshore, 
So the offshore um, uh, the, the evidence that we see is fairly limited in terms of the compression, but we do see it, and I'll show you a couple of slides to show you that, um, that, that the compression at the end of that phase in the Eocene. The next thing that happens is we have a rather big bang when the famous Chicksa Club uh, meteorite impact occurs. That is a very important part of the story, as we will see, because most of the known reserves in Mexico are directly linked to that impact for reasons that I'll go into later. So this impact is one of the most cataclysmic events in the geological record that we, we know on this planet. Uh, so I'll be showing you a few slides of that, some really interesting recent work that's been done on the nature of the impact. And then we have another event, a second shunt. So the first one is a mysterious kind of compression that is not well understood of plate subduction along the, uh, the, the, the western coast of uh, the USA and, uh, and Mexico. This one is also a collision that is probably initiated by the change in the Cocos plate uh, configuration. So we have a Galapagos hotspot that's created on the Cocos uh, plate ridge and that hotspot begins to subduct. So we have over thickened oceanic plateau that begins to subduct around about 20 million years ago. And the subduction of the Cocos of Nazca plate boundary with this uh, very thick pile of lavas has created a very important compression in the mid-Miocene and that is one of the big generating uh, events for petroleum systems in, uh, in the Campeche Basin because the whole basin is folded by this event. So the Miocene event, the second shunt, is a lot more important than the first one in the Eocene. The Eocene one created big mountains in the hinterland but didn't really propagate offshore. And then eventually, <clears throat> the last thing we have is a, a second kind of not very well known shunt that occurs in the last two million years, where it looks like we've had a very anomalous amount of uplift and erosion which has produced a big pile of Pleistocene sediment in the near shore area of the Campeche Basin. So we have many basins where salt has been evacuated due to downslope sliding and, and diaperism, where something like four kilometers of sediment has deposited in the last two million years. So uh, this second shunt is really uh, in two specific phases of something that happens when the, uh, the Nazca plate uh, sorry, the Nazca uh, Caucasus plate begins to subduct at uh, 22, and then we have this uh, next event uh, later on. And at the present day, the, the seabed is still being actively folded. So it's an extremely active basin. So let's have a look at the geological record of these events now. And I'm going to go through in chronological order and uh, look at the Triassic first of all. Now the thin vestiges of Triassic rocks that we have on shore in Mexico are probably not very indicative of what we may have in these big grotlands offshore. So we have bits of remnant half grotlands in the onshore area where there may be three, four hundred meters of red beds, if that. That's the kind of thickness that we're looking at. They're not very important in the onshore outcrops. Whereas when you look at the seismic data that's been shot recently, here's something I've pulled out of an AAPG Explorer I've heard. You can see below the salt there, which is arrowed in, in purple, that we have something like um, uh, three to four kilometers of sediment on this slide but even more, six, even seven kilometers further north. So there's a very big pile of sediment underneath the salt that we don't know what it is. There's one well that's been drilled so far by Pemex, a super tight well, I don't know anything about it, which poked down into the shallow bit of this, uh, this sequence in here. But all of this fill in here is still, uh, well, it's unknown. And we could well have good source rocks in there. We could have the Custrine Fasci's Riffay source rocks. There, there may be even marine sediments in there. We just do not know what is in that big pile of sediment. On this particular line, it's not going to be economic. Well, it's certainly going to be gas. 
and we're not going to drill down to that because that's probably around about 10, 12 kilometers depth. But elsewhere along the Yucatan Peninsula margin, there are areas where you can drill this, as PEMEX have done. And um, perhaps we may find some interest in um, some hydrocarbons in this uh, in this zone. Totally unknown, unknown, except for the one well. So I'm just going to show you the the Jurassic rifting now, and uh, the the nature of the, the age of the rifting. We talked about that Triassic carbon. Now I just picked out one particular area, which is up in the north of the Yucatan, which where you can nicely see the relationship between the salt and the later rifting phase in, in the Jurassic. So remember this salt is uh, probably Bajotian age um, or Bajotian Calovium. And if we look at what that salt looks like on most of the sections, it looks like this. It's a fairly flat base to it. So you can see here on this beautiful line drawing below that this is a really long regional line here. There's, there's a thin purple salt on there. And then there's this outer graben in here where the salt thickens up very considerably. That's our middle Jurassic uh, rift there that's being filled in with salt. It also has um, a, a quite thick tertiary sediment there. But that outline of that rift there, middle Jurassic age, uh, which is being uh, either rifted just before or during the salt deposition, is in this trend parallel to, to the Yucatan, Yucatan Peninsula. And we can go around the, the rest of the <coughs> Mexican basins uh, and look for hints of these Jurassic rifts. They're not very easy to spot on the deep water Campeche data because it's so deep. But when you go to the shallow margins, where this is the coastline here uh, in the, uh, in, in the Cam Campeche basin, so close to shore, where there's lots of wells that are drilled, you can see here, this is uh, highlighting a rift trend just from thickness and TOC values of the Tithonian source rock pooling in these half grovens, which are uh, the, the remnants of the, the earlier rift. So that trend there, we can put that on a map as well. And you see trends like this. There, there's a particularly clear example of a, a little Jurassic rift with a thicker fill of uh, Jurassic sediments in purple in there. So you can go around the shallow margins and look at these, and this is what we pulled out of the literature so far in terms of what the Jurassic gravens look like. So you can see that we've got a, a very well-defined system in this area from the Jurassic source rock trends. These are also defined by Jurassic source rock trends in shallow seismic where in the shallow water and onshore, you can see the rifts with that kind of trend. And those rifts are actually probably following the strike slip curve shear zone system, which allows the Yucatan Peninsula to pull away and curve through an arc of about 30 degrees that we see very clearly on the gravity data. So the gravity data that has been acquired by Samuel Smith and, uh, and company quite recently shows us a very clear pattern of uh, magnetic anomalies and uh, the, the mid-ocean ridge which are on the map at the back of the room there. So you can see there's definitely been a 30 degree rotation that's pulled away Yucatan and along this major shear zone system and the rifts are following that shear zone system in this part and then we've got rifts in here and rifts up in the mouth of the uh, Florida uh, Straits there between Yucatan and Florida we have good evidence of Jurassic rifting with quite a complex trendology there. So that's what we know about the Jurassic rifts forming from time of the salt deposition through to the Tithonium. Now we move on to the Laramide orogeny. So the, this, this mountain belt, the Sierra Madre, this beautiful photograph is showing you the typical hinterland of all of the Campeche and uh, the offshore uh, basins in Mexico, this is the hinterland, 3,000 meter high mountains all the way around the basin. So don't forget that, it's a really important part of the story that Mexico is essentially a mountain chain with a beautiful offshore basin that has been receiving all this sediment from this, uh, from this tremendous amount of erosion that has gone on from this along this mountain chain. So if we look in detail at the mountain belt, there's been some wonderful work 
Dum by Elisa Fitz Diaz, uh, who works in the University of uh, Mexico City. And she's done some really good field mapping and also dated the fault planes by looking at the illite in the fault planes and dating them by Argon 3940, which is a very accurate method of dating for, the, for those of you that know about it. And th those ages show us a progression of the fold belt and thrust belt through time. So you can see here the thrusting pro prograding from 83 million years at the back of the mountain belt out towards the coal sign, which is just off this section, by uh, 43 million years. So we see these propagating thrusts growing through the mountain belt over time, over a 40 million year period. So all the way through that period, we're having sediment being shed off <coughs> into the basin. Um, the, the, that whole system, the, the fold and thrust belt, generates a foil and basin at the front here, uh, where the sediment loading going on. Um, there's a bulge in here that's, uh, that, sorry, just to the, not this bulge, a similar bulge to that one, just to the front of the foreland this foreland bulge, which is called the Golden Lane, where we have a carbonate platform, which has always remained high. There's a foreland bulge, and we have uh, as many hundreds of millions of barrels of oil trapped in the Golden Lane. So you, uh, at least if it's DS plus our own work, we were able to look at the progradation of that fault pattern through map view. So this is mapping all the onshore structures and looking at the ages of the sediments and the hanging walls. It's very detailed work, allows you to show how the mountain belt grows through time and pro pro uh, progrades forwards. So this is late Campanian to early Paleocene. Sorry, that first one was earlier, Turonian, early uh, Campanian. So we get our first folds developed in here. Then you see it grows forwards by something like 100 uh, kilometers by uh, early Paleocene times, we're getting close to the coastline. And then we start to see by Eocene times as a, a, a pretty important phase of compression down in here. And that mountain belt now hits the coastline in the Eocene all the way along. So you can see that the fold and thrust belt has grown all the way along this margin now. There's still not much compression going on in the offshore area. So the response of the offshore is actually to respond to that mountain building event with downslope sliding and tail thrusting in the Perdido. So the well-known Perdido folds that have been worked on principally in the US sector where there's been quite a lot of successful exploration in here. You can see that the main phase of folding is uh, in the early Oligocene which is just after the mountain building phase in the onshore. So we're getting this big uplift of the mountains and then they're being slide forward on the salt quite early on. Whereas further south, we don't see any uh, folding because this area has got a detachment which finally fails on shales because there's no salt in this area. So we build up the overpressures for quite a long time in the Mexican ridges and eventually that basin fails as well and we get folding throughout. So this is in the Neogene and the, 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 now we have the Miocene event. This is the big compression that's caused by that subducting uh, Caucasus plate uh, plateau that affects all of the, uh, the, the Campeche basin. This is a Campeche that I'm gonna focus on in a minute. And then that downslope sliding along the rest of the fold belt is in here. So all these are Pleistocene and Pliocene folds. Very much later, once that detachment gets overpressured, it then begins to slide. So it takes a long time to build up sufficient overburden on this Eocene detachment before it fails and everything goes sliding off down the margin. So in that, those few slides there, you see that there's a beautiful uh, progression of controlled geology there showing you how that fold belt develops through time. Um, there are other folds and faults in there that we don't actually know the ages of that are filled in there with, uh, in the red. So it's a very ex uh, complex pattern that you see in there where we have this compression in the Eocene, which is um, Paleocene, which is more or less in this direction, 
And the compression in the Miocene is in this direction, which is about 40 degrees difference. And that is being affecting a margin, which is essentially uh, a passive margin from the Jurassic Ondas, which is flapping down this way. So this is the main center of thermal subsidence in here. So there's a tilt to the basin towards the west. And then there's a shunt like this, which is a long strike, and then a shunt like that, which is oblique. And there's those two things that are causing this extreme complexity that we see in the basin. So here's a, an example of the first shunt now in the Eocene. And what happens is that the diapirs that have been happily growing through the carbonate platform in Jurassic and Cretaceous times, and then the starved Cretaceous period, they get squeezed. And we see that we have Eocene canopies that are coming out already. So this is around Eocene stratigraphic interval in here and in here. Those canopies are coming out particularly in this area which is close to the coastline. So that's the east-west coastline adjacent to the Campeche Basin. So this area in the south has a lot of these Eocene sheets that are coming out. Um, some of those sheets then get evacuated to salt that's higher up, uh, or has just been totally squeezed out of the system. So we're left with quite extensive Eocene, mainly Eocene age wells, although it's cutting up to a higher level there. But a lot of that flat that you see on this weld is within that Eocene period. So that's the Eocene. And then we have the Chicxulub impact, which happens at uh, about that same time. This is 66 million years. Look at the detail of that age. It's one of the most detailed ages I've ever seen because there's been so many people that have tried to date this impact. 66 million and 32,000, uh, uh, 320,000, not 32,000 years, plus or minus 0 0.058. There's hundreds of uh, a very detailed measurements being made on this impact. We know its size from the hole that it created and the calculations of what size you would require to create a crater this size, which is a 177 kilometers wide. So the bolide is about 12 kilometers of very dense material that has a mass of 1 times 10 to the 14 kilograms. So I just did a little thought experiment, not Einstein stuff, but just looking at E equals half mv squared energy equals half the mass times the velocity squared. And with the terminal velocity that you have for this, which will be 7,000 kilometers an hour, you see the energy released. Uh, I couldn't think of a better way to show it than not many people probably know what it would like to experience a Hiroshima sized atom bomb, but this was 160 times mil 160 million atom bombs that hit the uh, surface at that particular point. A tremendous amount of energy released that uh, caused uh, the, 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 probably the extinction of the dinosaurs and many other, um, many other things on the planet. So this was the third largest mass extinction in the geological record that is more or less directly attributed to, the, to this event. And one of the reasons it was so devastating that has come out of, the, out of the recent work is because of the geology that was hit by the impact. So the meteorite hit a platform which was very rich in anhydrite on the Yucatan Peninsula. And when you heat anhydrite to several million degrees, it becomes sulfur dioxide. So there was a huge sulfur dioxide cloud that was emitted during the impact. And that was the key to the greenhouse effect because it's far more effective than CO2. If you have an atmosphere enriched in SO2, you know about it. It's a far greater greenhouse effect. And the dinosaurs found out about that as well. So it was just coincidence that this meteorite could have hit the bottom of the ocean and it wouldn't have made much of an impact at all, except for a tsunami. But this guy decided to hit the, probably the worst place it could hit where you could generate massive amounts of greenhouse gases by hitting the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, the other thing that's interesting on this is the, the amount of material that's blown out. So you get a huge amount 
a material that's blown out of the impact crater that's spread around the world. We have an iridium anomaly that goes all the way around the world. And that iridium anomaly is detected on top of the main oil fields in Mexico, in the Cantarell field, which I'll show you shortly, which is the biggest, well, one of the two biggest fields in Mexico with 40 billion barrels of oil in it. The top seal to the reservoir is the iridium dust at the base of the seal. So we know that the reservoir was created immediately before, uh, after the impact when the iridium dust fell, fell onto the, to the reservoir. That's why it's so important and I'm talking about this event. Uh, this uh, slide is quite recent, 2016 which is from a very interesting well that was drilled by the uh, IODP. And the IODP drilled this uh, in conjunction with scientists from the University of Texas in Austin and also the University of uh, Imperial College in London. And this was one of the papers that was published uh, by Professor Morgan from, you know, uh, from the University of London showing the, a simplistic uh, look at the well lock and the take-home message from this well lock, which is really interesting, is that there was one point, uh, there was almost a kilometre of basement rocks that have been drilled here. And all those basement rocks are completely fragmented and smashed. And when you look at the density of them, they're only about 2.2 grams per uh, centimetre cubed. And they have a veloc seismic velocity of about 3.5 kilometers per second, which for granites is very, very slow. So all this material is full of vein fill and voids and is a highly smashed up basement. It's not normal basement. So from that, they studied the, uh, the, the core and looked at the seismic data and came up with a model for how this has actually happened, this fractured basement, and what we see in the geometric relationships. So this is a, a, a numerical model that I'm going to show you now of uh, something like, uh, I think it's about five, five minutes of real geological time that you can see. And it's going to be condensed into about a minute of our time watching. And here we've got our 12 kilometer uh, bolide that's going to hit the surface. These are the mesozoic carbonates that you can see here. So this is the Jurassic and uh, early Cretaceous carbonates, full of anhydrite on that, uh, on that Yucatan Peninsula. And we're gonna hit that and smash it with this huge impact. And this scale, look at the scale, 40 kilometers deep and 100 kilometers wide. The scale is really important here because <coughs> you see some very impressive effects. So, Look at the hole, it's 25 kilometers deep, and the mountain chain is 30 kilometers high on there. That's all within about uh, half a minute. And then there's a big nap of basement rocks now, which squelches back out and goes over the top of the uh, Mesozoic carbonates underneath. So you've got this big outflow, which looks almost like a salt place here there, with, but with pre cambrian basement which has flowed over those uh, Jurassic carbonates to end up with that very interesting relationship there with the basement over thrusted on top of the, uh, the, the carbonates. Let me just run that again because it's a lot to take in. See the speed of that whole creation. Oh, sorry. Within a few seconds, we've created a hole that's 25 kilometers deep and it rebounds in the next few seconds and fills in in the next few minutes. 30 seconds there, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, 100 seconds, it's back to normal again. That incredible bit of geology that you see in there. Um, that shock wave probably created uh, a magnitude 11 earthquake, far larger than anything that we've actually experienced on the planet uh, in, in uh, historical times. And the result of that huge magnitude 11 earthquake was to destabilize the whole of the Yucatan Peninsula, the whole of the, uh, the, the, the seaboard along the western coast of Mexico as well. 
So this photograph is actually quite a ways from the Yucatan. This is up in the Tampico Mizantla Basin. And the edge of the Golden Lane Carbonates, which were produced on this foreland bulge, they collapsed down into the basin catastrophically and produced breaches that are a few hundred meters thick that fall off the edge of the carbonate platform. And that is the main reservoir that we have, which is important in Cantarell, is this brecture. But it has very poor intrinsic porosity. It's only got something like 10% porosity, and its permeabilities will be down at the uh, milli-dorsi level. So it's not a good reservoir. What you have to do with it is then reactivate it, fracture it, and fold it, and fold it, which is what happens in, during the Miocene orogeny. So in the Miocene orogeny, we rework this uh, breccia, and that is the key to the success of the really big fields in Mexico. It's not only thanks to the meteorite creating that breccia, but it's then the plate tectonics which compresses the basin, folds and thrusts those carbonate breccias so that they become world-class reservoirs in really large structures. So this is the uh, location and thickness of that Tamabra breccia, which is produced by the collapse along the margins. A nice paper by Sanford et al. That, that have looked at all the outcrops in the onshore in Mexico, uh, some well data in there as well. And you can see that within a thousand kilometers, we're still at tens to hundreds of meters of breccia in here. The breccia is over a kilometer here and four or 500 meters thick in here. So we've got these collapsed breccias falling off all the way around into Cuba, and possibly present in this eastern side of the Yucatan, although there's not been any exploration there so far. Um, the, so even further away, this is a beautiful paper that's just been published on what is called uh, the deathbed in Hell's Creek near to uh, 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 in North Dakota. And this is 3,000 uh, kilometers away now from the impact. Um, in this particular deposit that has been analyzed by uh, Brian De Palma, you say, oh, sorry, Robert De Palma, you see these fish, and the fish actually have molten spherules trapped in their gills. So the fish have died by the, the molten material coming out of the impact, going up into the air and creating these glass spherules. And the glass spherules have fallen down, and the fish have breathed them in, and that was the end of them. So we know that the fish actually died during the impact. And not only the fish, it's just full of everything. Ammonites, mesosaurs, uh, the whole thing is capped by an iridium layer as well. And all the fish are aligned in a certain direction. So all the dead fish are showing the flow direction of the wave of water that smashed through the basin. Now the interesting thing is that if you do the calculations on this deposit, which is 3,000 kilometers away from the Yucatan, there's no way that it was a tidal wave that created this, because it didn't have time to get there. Those ferules are dropping out of the impact in a few seconds after the meteorite ha happened to a minute. It would have taken a tsunami several hours to get that far. So what we think has happened here is that we created a seish, which is a standing wave which is created by a big earthquake. And the standing wave in the water stands up 100 meters in the air by the calculations that they've done. So you just have this water that begins to jiggle with a magnitude 11 earthquake. And then it sets up a resonance in the lake. And all of a sudden these standing waves just rise up 100 meters. And then they slot back down and have caused this devastation and everything to be aligned uh, parallel to the flow direction as the wave collapses. So a really interesting paper there that uh, if you're interested in the geology of the, the, uh, the impact, that's probably the best geological example in the record of what actually happened. And you see it in the seismic. So this uh, beautiful bright event that we see that I've highlighted with the uh, blue arrow there, this is the Tamabra breccia and uh, the deep water. So where it gets folded and thrusted, like in here, it may be a reasonable reservoir. 
but elsewhere where it's flat it's probably going to have no intrinsic porosity and permeability for a deep water play. It might work onshore, but certainly not in the offshore. So we've got to fold and thrust this stuff to get it into condition to, for, for an economic hydrocarbon deposit. And this was the guy that did it, the mid to late Miocene compression. This really important event that occurred due to this oceanic plateau that began to try and subduct underneath the, uh, the western seaboard of Mexico, wasn't able to do it so easy, so it began to compress the margin. And we see that compression throughout the basin. It's a bit dark with colors on here, but the, the red lines through here, all the folds that, and, and thrusts that go all the way through this part of the basin that are created by this compression. So this compression has affected this whole area. You see that in here it gets a bit more complex. There's a lot of uh, strike slip faulting through this part of the, the basin. And this is where Cantarell is up here with thrust, <coughs> thrust in this way. So I think there's a, a lateral lap ramp effect here where we're beginning to run out of salt on this side of the basin. So this shunt in this direction creates a, a, a left lateral shear component in here. And we set up this complex series of strike slip faults through here that are uh, accommodating that difference in the displacement that can move a lot more on top of the salt here than this area, which is fixed. So we end up with a very complex pattern of faulting in Cantorell, uh, which uh, I'll show you a slide through that shortly. Onshore, this is the kind of deformation that we see, and it's spectacular fold and thrust belt tectonics. This is a typical line from the uh, onshore area of uh, the uh, Suresti Campeche Basin, where we've got salt cores in the Jurassical Topham of salt here, and thrust climbing all the way up through the stratigraphy. Some of this is probably early growth, uh, with some of these being Eocene age thrust. You can see the growth there, and then the Miocene growth in here, where they reactivate again. So we're re reactivating those thrusts twice with these two shunts. And when we go into the offshore, this is a, a really nice paper that was published very recently by Snyder and Jackis in uh, APG Search and Discovery. Some nice long regional lines through here. And those long regional lines are showing you this spectacular uh, uh, effect of the compression in the Miocene. These really big folds in here that have got two to four kilometers of amplitude with wavelengths of 10 to 15 kilometers across. Those really big folds are going to be targets for future exploration. There's a well drilling at the moment, which is drilling one of these big folds that's been drilled uh, by Petronas. Um, besides the straightforward folding of the autochthonous salt, and we got autochthonous cores to the folds, you see there's tremendous extrusion of salt so a lot of the salt that's got to the surface has done this in the mid Miocene through to present. And these sheets have gone streaming across the basin. And they're very important because on the, with, with that kind of tectonics there, of sheets coming out early in the Eocene and also in the Miocene, we cool down the subsalt geology. So the high conductivity of the salt is really important in the story for these areas. Because once you get thick sheets of salt coming out, that salt is very highly conductive, and it gets the heat out of the basin rapidly, so our basin doesn't heat up as much. Because when you look at the thickness of the sedimentary fill that we have in here, you'd be highly uncomfortable if that was all plastic sediment. This is something like 10 kilometers of burial to the source rock, which is in that blue horizon just near to it. So you'd be expecting gas in this area. But you look at the actual seabed slicks that are present throughout this area, and there's oil literally bleeding out everywhere from every one of these surface extrusions of salt. So all these really big ex surface extrusions are tapping down to a source rock, which is still generating oil below those allotment sheets. Uh, th this one to the south um, has got some nice features on it as well that I'll uh, try to explain in a bit more detail. 
Uh, this scale is a bit difficult to, to show you, but I'm going to zoom in to one or two of these repeat types of geometry that you can see in here. And what you see is an overthrust of the carbonates climbing up, being overthrusted. And on the top of every overthrusted sheet, there's a little cup of salt extrusion in here, little blobs of salt that have climbed up the, uh, over, underneath the overthrusted sheet and then squeezed out to the seabed. So each one of those has got a very similar geometry to it, of these old thrusted carbonate sheets being shunted with a little blob of salt on top. But I'll show it. I think I'll, I know how that forms and I'll show you in a minute. Uh, this, this one was just showing you that complexity of the strike slip deformation along that lateral ramp. So you've got these complex strike slip faults and then the frontal folds and thrusts. And this is where the big oil fields are in here. So we're going to look at one of these frontal folds and thrusts now in the next slide and show you the importance of that overthrusting and the folding. Because what that does is to take those carbonates up to the seabed. So you can see that the, uh, the, the carbonate breccia that was formed at 66 million years, it's here in the triangles and it's actually eroded on the crest of the fold in there. So we know that this has got up to seabed it's been leached, dissolved, fractured, it's got big caverns in it, and it's thanks to that we've got this 14, 40 billion barrels of oil, which is recoverable, because we were able to take those uh, carbonates high up, leach them, it could have been below uh, uh, the, the ground level, and you could have had a lot of groundwater percolation in there as well, but I think this one has actually made it to the surface. So there may be others that don't quite make it to the seabed that get leached and fractured, dolmatized, and they would also be uh, highly prospective reservoirs. You can see that the, the main field is in the overthrusted sheet above, but there, are, there is actually oil in the underlying sheet too, although it's not as productive. So the main productive horizon is in here at this level. So <clears throat> how do I think those overthrusted sheets form? I think they're asymmetric diapirs that have grown in, from salt rollers to begin with. This is the classic downslope sliding salt tectonics here, where we have triangular salt rollers that have formed in the foot wall of an extending fault. These are the mesozoic carbonates in here and the Colombian Bajocian age salt. And then if we try and uh, shut that, uh, it may have grown up into a diapir as well. But we've got an asymmetry in there that you can see already, with this flat in the uh, foot wall being higher than the hanging wall. So it's not a great stretch of imagination to uh, see what will happen with the virgins, but all these things will thrust in this direction when we close them, and we end up with all these overthrusts going towards the basin and dragging up the salt along the shear zone which is created and the salt gets dragged up by frictional drag and squeezes out into this little blob of salt that we have at the top. And then that back limb is where we may ought to find uh, oil and gas deposits because that overthrusted limb now has got up to seabed or close to the seabed, highly fractured and leached and these overthrusts have never been tested except in the shallow water. <coughs> So there's lots and lots of repeat structuring, similar to what we see in Cantorell in the offshore area, but we've not got a single well yet that has tested these carbonates in the deep water. But the Petronas well is drilling at the moment is testing something similar to this. So the, uh, the, the, the Petronas well has got a main target in a big carbonate fold, which has hopefully got this uplifted mesozoic carbonate, which has been leached and fractured. So that, that's what is happening at the present day with some of these overthrusted carbonate sheets. And you can see this one's got very close to the surface. It's actually collapsed now, the whole of the scarp face with faults and uh, debris flows in here. Salt is exposed at the seabed and there may be even a brine reflection there from the dissolving salt that you see this diffuse reflectivity in the seawater. And then if we rebury that with sediment, that would be our play, drilling into here on one of these big overthrusted and fractured and leached carbonate sheets. 
So that, that's the uh, evolution of one of those structures in the cartoon format, showing you the overthrusted sheet then collapsing and being faulted and debris flows pounding on the top in between the, the collapsed scarp and the, uh, the blob of salt that's squeezing out of the seabed. And eventually these things get folded back on themselves, the salt on you can see there, it's folded back on itself by further compression. So complex interest in evolution, but none of these structures have been drilled so far. So this is the Garibaldi structure, and this does have overthrust to the south and north of it. So again, from this uh, recent paper of AAPG Search and Discovery. And this big fold here, you can see that the Mesozoic carbonate is coming from depth, uh, something like eight kilometers depth here, rising up in this particular slide it gets to about three kilometers below seabed but in fact that gets to within a few hundred meters of seabed on other lines within a 3d survey so this huge carbonate structure has grown up during this miocene compression you can see that all the other stratigraphy is more or less parallel until we get to the miocene growth syncline there and then we squeeze this almost to seabed the carbonate in some places and we're hoping that that has not leaked out all the hydrocarbons. There's certainly a massive oil seep which is leaking out the top of the structure at the moment. But we hope there's dynamics going on here, dyna dynamic equilibrium. Because there's somewhere for certain around the margins of this, the source rocks, there's a large fetch on this, it's quite a long structure. The source rocks are in the oil window. They're generating oil at the present day, live oil. That oil should be migrating into the structure, um, displacing any gas in there, hopefully. Um, we should have, hopefully, some oil in here. There's certainly oil bleeding out very <coughs> rapidly at the surface. So every time the oil column builds up a bit too much, there'll be dynamic leakage, we hope, and we're losing some of that oil into the, uh, into the seawater. Now, this is the most recent image in that's available from the WAS data that Slumberger has shot. There's been quite a few uh, small publications in the literature now uh, with uh, adverts as well. And I just picked out one nice example to show what we can see underneath the sheets now for the very first time. You need this good quality data to be able to look underneath these complex sheets. Just a bit of complexity on the base salt there and the top, the top is highly complex with, with probably cap rocks on there with varying velocities. But we've now got such good uh, wide azimuth data where the ray paths are coming in like this. And from here with turning waves and, and RTM data, you can image in here without actually having a ray path going through the salt body. So we can see underneath without the distortion of the salt and see these uh, incredible big folds that we see in here that are in that area where we hope there are going to be both the carbonates and the underlying uh, early Miocene, middle Miocene sands. So late Miocene would be out at this interval in here, also possibly trapped below the frontal edge of the salt. But we're looking at these earlier reservoirs, Eocene to mid Miocene around underneath that salt sheet. And I've talked about the importance of these salt sheets and the cooling effect. I just thought I'd throw this one in to show you that importance with what happens when you put a big slab of salt into the basin. And this is a, a, a rather complicated slide, but the, the bottom line of this is that these are the isotherms stable before the sheet comes in. So that's a normal geothermal gradient there, increasing monotonously from 10 degrees C in the seawater to 140 degrees C at 7 kilometers depth. If all of a sudden you extrude a salt sheet above that, you depress the isotherms. <coughs> and this basin here is full of salt now rather than sediment as it's come across the seabed on top of the sediment. So you depress all the isotherms from here was 140 before the salt sheet arrived. We now put this thick salt sheet in here that's about uh, six kilometers thick. That seems a lot, but there's a lot of evidence on the seismic data for salt sheets this thick. 
Uh, that is the position now of the isotherm 140 down here. Uh, 120 is here, the maximum peak generation of oil. So maximum peak generation of oil now in the source rock is at 10 kilometers to 11 kilometers depth, rather than up in here at six. So that really deep buried source rock now is back in the oil window because of the salt sheet climbing across the seabed. And it never recovers. You can see on this slide, I'm showing you how the, the 120 degree isotherm in here recovers over time over a period from 40 million years in the Eocene to the present day. And it just never gets back to normal when you've got halite in the system. With the thermal conductivity and the radiogenic component that you have in shale, you very quickly get back to thermal equilibrium. So if you pile six kilometers of shale onto the basin, you'll get a depression in the isotherm, and then boom, within a period of 10 million years, it's bounced back to normal again. So it's a very short transient period of thermal disequilibrium. But with salt, it just stays there, that thermal anomaly. So underneath that sheet there, that where the source rocks underneath here are buried down at this level, which may well be at eight to 10 kilometers depth, that should be nicely sat in the oil window since that sheet was extruded uh, 25 million years ago, 20 million years ago. So at least for that period of time, We've kept the, uh, the source rock in the oil window. What you've got to calculate is whether that source rock had already become over mature before that sheet extruded. So there you've got to date through time when those sheets extrude and look at the burial history of whether the sheet has been too deeply buried before the salt sheet comes out. And if it hasn't, then good, you've kept that oil in the source rock, the source rock in the oil window. Okay, so um, getting to the end now, this is the, uh, the last bit of compression that we see. There's this spectacular Pliocene Pleistocene compression that occurs in this area, which is essentially caused an uplift at uh, two million years. And that uplift has caused a tilting, and the tilting actually causes downslope sliding. So the downslope sliding is actually going down to the basin in this direction, and all the blue faults that you can see on there are the extensional slides that are created by the sediment loading from this uplift and a big sediment dump that comes into the basin here and causes more basin tilt. So let me do that again with my hands. So we compress this way, create a, an even faster rate of growth on the Chappas Massif in here. That causes uplift, a lot of sediment piles into the basin here with four kilometers of sediment deposited. That causes a tilt and everything slides off. So you see this in the uh, very well exposed in the seismic data and in the, in the, in the front of the, uh, this area you see compression. So huge amount of extension caused by the tilting and the sediment loading and then compression of the front, all in that last two million year period. And this is a map of the mini basins that have been produced by that extension. So these mini basins are very substantial features. We're looking at the areas that are 150, 300 kilometer long mini basin there. This one's almost the same length there, perhaps 250. And these big deeper centers are sliding off in this direction. And that's what they look like. <clears throat> so sometimes there'll be extensional faults that are down to the basin. Sometimes there'll be a counter-regional fault that dips back towards the land. But essentially, we're now evacuating salt from the system along this Alochthonus Miocene detachment now. So these are the big Alochthonus Miocene sheets that have come out that then get loaded. And they begin to weld out. Uh, in this very quick period of only two and a half million years. So that mini basin there, Pescadores, is uh, something like four seconds two-way time. So that's going to be about four kilometers thick, that basin there, only deposited in the last 2.4 million years. So a huge amount of plastic sediment coming into the basin, very rapid loading. 
Um, quite a lot of oil and gas is trapped within these sands in here, in all these very obvious structures. But there's hardly any exploration down in here with all these extensive locks and sheets. Totally unknown what is going on down there. Um, this is like being in the US sector of the Gulf of Mexico back in the early 70s. We got these allotment sheets, nobody knew what was underneath them, nobody dared drill them. We now know that most of the oil that's being found in the Gulf of Mexico is drilling through those sheets. Yet here in Mexico, there's probably a handful of wells that have drilled through those sheets, literally five wells that are onshore. Nothing, in, uh, I think there's one in the offshore. That's it. So we've got a huge potential here that is just totally untapped. It's one of the most exciting places in the world to explore in the shallow water in here. Remember, this is only in 100 meters water depth here. And that same geology that you see on that line persists onshore for another 100 kilometers onshore. So you can go and drill wells for $5 million onshore drilling deep water turbidites through a lot of salt sheets, just like you drill in the US sector, where you spend $150 million drilling them. Here you can drill that same play for $5 million on shore. And then as you go out into the deep water, you see the compressional toe, which is all this folding here along this frontal edge. This is a nice ion line that's more or less running along strike through here through all those folds. And you can see it's almost parallel stratigraphy all the way up through there until you get to that very last two million year interval where we get very rapid growth of the sediment fill in these growth synclines. So all of those folds have gen generated in about the last two million years that ties in quite nicely with the mini basin development in the shallow water. So a word about the sedimentation now, and uh, I'm not sure that I've got the whole story here because I'm just using public domain information. Some of you guys in the room are going to know a lot more about this than I do using all the new 3D. But the old 3D that has been mapped by Pemex shows us how the pattern of, uh, of channels filled has developed through time. And I just want to run that through you, uh, now and show you where we think the main sands are coming into the basin. So we've already talked about this important <coughs> mountain chain. Remember that mountain chain is probably three to four kilometers high, all the way from Eocene to Miocene. <coughs> but it was also very good for producing sand, because a lot of the areas <coughs> that are most uplifted in here these are arc granites, island arc granites, and uh, Paleozoic quartzites. So you have very good sand sources in here and also through here that are granites. So through that uplifted mountain belt, we've got a good sand source. And you see there's a prominent gap in the topography at the present day. Probably didn't exist back in the Eastling Palisade through here, but there's a distinct low in this kink in the coastline through here. So high mountains here, high mountains here, and a low in here. And I'm pointing that because it seems like that's where there's been a lot of erosion and, and sediment deposition. So when you look at through time now where <coughs> the Eocene channels are coming in, it's very clear that there is a lot of uh, potential in here in the onshore basins. And out in the front, this is the edge of the salt basin in here. Out of the front ledge of the salt, there's a lot of Eocene sand coming in. And there's a lot of sand coming in here as well. Now remember at this time, there's a few alloctomous sheets out in here that have been produced. But essentially, we're looking at upright diapirs through the Eocene and a basin slope, which is down to the west because of the thermal subsidence. So it's a fairly simple geology in the Eocene with these sands running along the front of the salt basin, and some sands possibly getting out in here, running through a few individual isolated uh, salt sheets and a few diapirs. So it's quite easy to get the sand out quite a long way. But as we go through time, you see the Oligocene's getting a bit further out now, as far as we can see. The Oligocene's get, getting as far up as here, possibly, but a lot of it deposited here. 
And then in the Miocene, a lot of evidence, again, for Miocene sands in this area. A lot more seismic in this area, but it was 3D when this map was generated. So there seems to be a lot less evidence for the Miocene. But a lot more seismic further north. Now remember, by the time we get to the Miocene, we are in a situation where there's a lot of a lot from the sheets around, a lot more salt got to surface. So there's a big tree uh, forest of tall diapirs in here. These tall trees growing everywhere with big canopies on top. And they're going to be a barrier to the sediment getting out into the basin. So I may be wrong, but one of the big issues I have is that by Miocene times, You've got a basin to, to the west. You've got a forest of salt structures in here that are all creating positive topography, of probably several hundred meters at least at the seabed. How are you going to get sands to run through from this very preferred deeper centers here through, uh, from the clastic source out into the ultra deep water in here? You can't really appeal to the Yucatan because there are east west channels coming through here because we know that this has been a stable carbonate platform throughout that whole period of history. There are no plastic sources around as far as we know. We just enrolled in anhydrite and carbonates up in here. So one issue for me, and I may be missing something, is that this is going to be difficult for the plastics to work compared to further south. So uh, some of the people in the audience may have mapped some good channels out in here now, and prove me wrong, I hope they do, but it is a worry for me, yeah, and that's why I'm laboring this point, is that we've got this fantastic sand source here, but everything is going to naturally turn and go down dip once it gets out into the basin and, and is blocked by these obstacles. <coughs> so, uh, just to finish up, I think these are the last slides, just showing you a bit of the, the, uh, the, the geology with that simple idea of the upright diapirs. Then the Eocene canopies are coming out. This is just summarizing what I've said, with mainly down to the base and sliding of the Eocene uh, canopies, but they're quite restricted and close to the coastline compared to what happens in the Miocene. And then the Miocene, we have these very extensive canopies that are coming out. They may thicken up to four or five kilometers thick. They themselves get folded. So the ramps and flats that you see that are climbing up through the stratigraphy here don't necessarily correspond to the folding at the top. That folding is not only due to compression, it's also due to mini base and loading as well. So you get an incongruous geometry between the top and the base where an anticline may be a syncline at depth. And that's what makes the seismic difficult to capture. Remember, you've got these two directions of compression as well. And then finally, the mini basins down slope sliding there that bury these Miocene sheets, great wells, and all of this geology now is deeply buried and difficult to image. And that's where I think a lot of the potential is going to lie down in here uh, once we start having the courage to drill through those sheets. And here's a person who had courage, thinking of the future, thinking of Frida Kahlo, who was relatively unknown within her life. So she was one of the uh, influential artists at the time, but almost forgotten when she died in 1954. And it was only in the 70s that I think the Louvre bought one of her paintings back in the 70s. But now she is a world famous Mexican artist, the most famous artist in Mexico. And I'm thinking of somebody like that who was so far sighted that was doing things that nobody thought of doing and she was not respected in her own era. And that's what some of you young people should be thinking about in the audience. Can you do an exploration Frida Kahlo and come up with new ideas that are out there with this really complex geology that we've got and find new things that everybody might think you're crazy at the beginning but then you're found right. Um, we, we've got conventional exploration going on at the moment with bright spots that have been identified with reprocessing seismic. This is above the salt and was the world-class discovery that was drilled at Zama. And there's going to be a lot more of those in the future. But what I'm interested in is, uh, is going a bit deeper and 
seeing what we can find down here. And I take my hat off to um, the Talos uh, group and Sierra getting in here so early and reprocessing seismic and finding a world-class discovery like that. And it makes me think of how that was done. And my version of what happened here is that a small consortium got into this area with a good idea, <clears throat> with not very good seismic, but went for a block at a reasonably high price. They were the only people that actually met the, uh, the, the um, minimum bid that the Mexican government had imposed. And they had this good idea of getting into a basin where it's got all the ingredients, but we don't really know what's in the block until we get it. But we know we've got slicks everywhere, we know we've got world-class source rock which generated hundreds of millions of barrels adjacent to this. Full of structures, full of sand coming to the basin. Go and get the block, then get the seismic and process it. So I think there's a lot of times with, certainly with big companies now that don't, uh, they don't want to take risks. Here's a smaller company taking a risk, getting into a block without really knowing what's going on and then making a world-class discovery that's got a billion barrels in. So sometimes we'll, we'll out science ourselves and by the time you've got the size, make the box gone, somebody else has got it. So I, I think there's a good message there for people being bold and if you think you've got the ingredients right, get in there at an early stage before everybody else does. There's the oil water contact. Um, this is the future. This is where we hope that some bright sparks are going to be able to Im actually image bright reflectors and channels underneath this now with this kind of data and be able to drill through these sheets at least we can see there's a structure there still don't know whether there's a reservoir but now the seismic is getting so good we might actually be able to see evidence of reservoirs and even oil water contacts under some of these salt sheets and this is the one that i think is drilling at the moment the gary baldy structure uh, so hopefully for the future this deep Carbonate play may work. You can see the carbonate has been eroded and there's a scarp in there. Uh, there's a huge structure in there with good fetch area with source rocks that are bound to be in the oil window at some point on that structure. See again a beautiful image underneath the salt there. So we're in really fantastic shape in this basin. There's hardly any wells drilled. There's five wells in the onshore that are drilled pre salt, no wells in the offshore that have drilled this kind of target. And the whole basin is full of structures like this with oil bleeding out of every single one. Every time you see a big structure like that, where either the salt or the carbonate with the source rock is getting close to seabed, there's an oil slick. So the world's best place for finding oil for me at the moment. And there's the situation of what's been drilled so far. Just look at all the wells, they all go to the top of the salt and there's nothing underneath. So this is what's happening in the future. There's uh, th these wells that are going to go down shortly. These have been the recent discoveries that we've had. All these have got oil in. We know that these are both economic. This one we don't know much about. It's been kept under wraps at the moment. And there's been a couple of discoveries up in the Perdido as well. But watch the space here for these wells. This one was drilling at the moment, Garibaldi, and these are going to be going down shortly. And um, hopefully we're going to see some more uh, lookalikes to these guys being found. Okay, so took a couple of take home messages from all that stuff I've shown you. That is probably the most important thing I want to say is that this Miocene compression event is really important to the potential of this basin for creating the structures, these massive folds, and reworking this Chicxico Breccia to give us those massive oil fields that we see in the shallow water. And we hope there's going to be quite a few of those discovered still in the deeper uh, thrusted blocks. And then this uh, more uh, not so well known event in the Shapas, which is uh, in the last two million years, has poured in a huge amount of high quality reservoirs into that shallow water. So very good reservoirs all the way through the Miocene and into the Pliocene. And we've got this new seismic now that's going to make things a hell of a lot easier in this very complex basin. 
But there's a couple of problems I mentioned. Can the sand get right out to that northern part of the basin? And are some of these structures actually breached with this continuing compression at the present day? It is a problem. And then one last thing, it's just a plug for a conference that's coming off in London that if any of you are on the other side of the Atlantic in May, we've got an excellent set of talks. I'm one of the organizers for this conference. It's a three-day conference, so on, on, mainly on Mexico, but with uh, three quarters of a day on the Caribbean. And uh, we've got a, a really good selection of talks, both academics and oil company people. There's going to be talks on Zama and new discoveries and Equinor are giving papers as well. So there's going to be some very good talks and uh, you, uh, hopefully you, if you want to go, you want to be signing up soon because it's nearly fully subscribed now. Okay, thanks very much.